<clears throat> well, good morning. Good morning. Um, I am uh, Paul Young. Um, I am your instructor for organic. Um, I put up some things on Blackboard, sent everyone an email. I certainly hope that you saw it. And I hope you got a copy of the syllabus and a copy of the mini print handouts that we'll be using today. The mini prints are actually very, very important. Um, uh, this, this is a PDF file. There are six little images per slide, um, stuff like that. The reason that they're so important is that we cover lots of material and we're going to do it fairly quickly. And this is the summer, etc. So, what do we do? We have to do a lot of stuff. Basically, a chapter every time we meet. Um, you're going to be challenged a little bit. If you sit and you write everything down, um, and the mini prints help you avoid having to write the stuff that's on the slides. Um, they give you a space to work the problems as we come to them. You learn to write very, very small, which is good. Um, so all those things. Make sure if you don't have them, make sure that you start doing it for the next chapter. Um, I'll put them up as soon as I can. And again, this is through Blackboard. Um, this is the Blackboard URL. Please make sure that you're on there. Check um, to make sure that the email address that they have listed for you is one that works. Um, and check it often because there'll be lots of stuff there. The uh, text. The text. Students taking chemistry. What's that do? If it's organic, send them in. That's okay. I don't care. Lots of people. I don't care. Um, the text is Organic Chemistry, um, the eighth edition. Um, it's a beautiful book. Um, I worked with John McMurray for many years. Um, it's well written. Everyone loves McMurray's books, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The downside is that it's really, really expensive. Um, books have just gone crazy these days. And it is very, very expensive. Um, if you go online, you can in fact find the sixth edition for about 15 bucks. Um, that one works fine. The uh, chapters have changed a little bit, the chapter sequences. I see some of you have the uh, book already. Um, if you haven't written in it or whatever, you may be able to return it. Save yourself a couple hundred dollars. Um, this edition will work perfectly fine. You'll have to think a little bit. Um, some of the chapters uh, have been reordered, but the basic content is essentially the same. So <clears throat> that's a good thing. We also need um, the lab manual. We will do our first lab on Thursday. Um, so make sure you have this. You need the goggles. Um, goggles are designed to be uncomfortable and to make you look really stupid, but you must wear them, okay? That's just the way it is. Um, especially organic lab. In organic lab, um, you're dealing with lots of chemicals. Um, some of these can be toxic. They can be absorbed through your skin easily. Um, you certainly don't want them to splash on your face. So. Uh, do have to be very, very careful with stuff like that. In the syllabus <clears throat> is a paragraph that looks like this. Basically, it just tells you what the course is. We're going to do the first oh, 10, 11 chapters, and then we'll jump to chapter 17 just for the heck of it. But um, <clears throat> that's what we're going to do. Uh, I am scheduled to teach the follow-up course of S-235 in the fall. So um, 
if you manage to survive with me, <coughs> we will continue with the same sort of stuff. Let's see. The schedule is in the syllabus. Today we're going to do chapter one. Um, because it's going to move so quickly, you really do want to be here. Um, I don't like taking attendance. I just don't. Um, so if you're not here, tell me, okay? <laughs> or whatever. Uh, let's see, cell phones and blah, 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 yeah, whatever. <clears throat> During the uh, course of the year, the semester, we will have three exams in class here. We will have a final exam on the last day. And before each of the exams, there will be an online quiz. The online quiz will be on Blackboard. Typically, these will be 20 questions. The way they're designed, I have a very large question database on Blackboard. And it will go in and it will randomly pick 20 questions, give it to you as an exam or a quiz. Yeah? So you're saying three exams plus a final? Or right. three exams is and the final? Three exams and the final. Um, the quizzes will be set on Blackboard so that they will keep your highest score. Typically, you will get uh, two to three attempts after doing the quiz. Um, they're 20 points each, and they're a mixture of multiple choice, a uh, short answer, and stuff like that. Um, Blackboard is... Uh, on the quizzes, like, uh, how many quizzes are we doing in the... On my board, there will be three quizzes. Three quizzes? Mm -hmm. Okay. So, very important that you go to Blackboard, make sure you're on there, and make sure everything is set up properly. Let's see. <clears throat> um, everyone wants to know about grades. Well, <clears throat> um, the syllabus that uh, <coughs> If you have the mini prints, there's a mini print of this slide. It's wrong because I left the quizzes out. Exams are 100 points each. The total in the lab is about 200. Uh, quizzes at 60, that's 20 points each, and 200 for the final. We typically grade on a 90, 80, 70 scale. Um, this works. Um, I've taught this course many, 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 many times at UIC. I taught there for 37 years, and most of the time I taught undergraduate and graduate level organic and biochemistry. So I've done this to classes of 500 people, a lot, and a lot different than having 12, 13, it really is, but anyway. so. Um, Typically, over the years, the material and the exams and everything have evolved to the point that this almost works perfectly without even having to prove. So, in addition to these points here, um, there may be other points that show up. They'll simply be added in, and then we go to the same 90, 80, 70, 60. So, you know, it's a little bit dynamic. There's also going to be something called extra credit. Um, extra credit will show up. Typically, I'll tell, tell you about it in class. Another good reason to come. And um, that will count. However, it will not increase the point total. Okay? So it truly is extra credit. How many uh, points of extra credit would you say are well, it throughout the semester? You know, it depends. I don't know. Um, what I feel like. It's extra credit, you know. <laughs> whatever I feel like. So <clears throat> that's the basics. Now today in chapter one, actually chapter one and most of chapter two, um, should be could be renamed everything that you should have learned in general chemistry. Okay? So we're gonna hit the high points of structure and bonding um, in chapter one. We're going to do a little bit of an intro to organic structures. 
And then in chapter two, we're going to continue that. By the time we hit chapter three, we'll be doing real organic chemistry. Any questions before we get started? Remember, um, sixth edition, seventh edition, they all work. You can get them cheap, um, and that's good. All right, well, let's go ahead and do this then. Let's go ahead and start off at the very beginning with the structure of atoms. Now, anyone that's seen Jimmy Neutron or even Big Bang Theory, or whatever, <coughs> recognizes the classic 1950s version of what an atom was. Big honking <coughs> nucleus in the middle and electrons in little orbits. Well, it's not really like that. Um, quantum chemistry describes it differently. Basically as a cloud of electrons surrounding a little b tiny nucleus in the middle. This is um, a representation of carbon. Organic chemistry is going to be the chemistry of carbon, very much centered on that. Um, carbon has six protons in its nucleus, this little guy way in here. Um, six neutrons, typically, although it can have seven or eight, and it has six electrons in a cloud. We'll see today that the cloud um, is actually consists of two levels. These guys we'll call core electrons here in the middle. They don't do much. And these guys on the outside are called um, valence electrons. And those are the ones we care about because these are the guys that are involved in bond making and bond breaking. Oh, I forgot to mention, um, every word that we say in class here and all of these slides in real time are being recorded as we speak, okay? Um, these will, well, there will be a link on Blackboard for you to go to YouTube, actually. I found YouTube to be a very nice medium to show them because you can, like, use a little slider, go back and forth and find it, okay, find a section. So everything that we say and do will be recorded. Now, that is assuming, of course, that my recording software is working properly. So, it almost always works. Uh, I hope it's working now. There's no way to tell until it's over. But, so just so we know that. All right, let's talk a little bit about atoms in general. Um, first of all, they're very, very small. Let's make sure we all recognize just how small they are. If this was, in fact, a candy made of copper, which of course it isn't, uh, it would contain roughly 28 sextillion atoms. Huge number of atoms. Subatomic particles are very, very small. Uh, mass of a proton is about 1.7 times 10 to the minus 24 grams. Neutron is essentially the same, and an electron is significantly less. Now, what that means is that the mass of an atom basically consists of protons plus neutrons. Now remember, protons and neutrons live in the nucleus. Um, when I made this slide, I tried my best to show just how teeny tiny this nucleus was. I used a single pixel, okay, but even that is wrong. Um, a better way to show it, I think, is this cute little slide. This is Wrigley Field. Now, if you look very, very closely, here in the infield, right about there, is a golf ball. Now, if we were dealing with a typical atom, the nucleus could be represented by the size of this golf ball. And the electron cloud surrounding it would be the entirety of Wrigley Field, including the rooftop regions. So basically, atoms are totally empty space. The electrons contribute a little bit to the mass, but virtually all of the mass is this little tiny dot here that's the nucleus. 
All right. <clears throat> um, elements contain only one type of atom. That's simple. Um, every element is represented by a chemical symbol. Once again, we all should know all of this from general chemistry, high school, fifth grade, whatever. Chemists and organized um, atoms according to the periodic table. We have a periodic table here. Um, on exams, you will be given a periodic table, um, although you really won't need it very much. Um, this isn't general chemistry. This is your uh, standard periodic table. Um, the atomic number represents the number of protons. Of course, we have the atomic symbol. And underneath that, we have the average atomic mass. The carbon is 12.01. Carbon typically contains six protons, six neutrons, as we said. And again, the average mass is 12.01. Now, this is the real periodic table. Organic chemistry evolved from the study of natural <coughs> products. And so it focuses on just a few elements. This is the organic chemist version of the periodic table, where you can ignore darn near everything in white. We're dealing with the chemistry of carbon, nitrogen, oxygen, halogens, a little bit of phosphorus and sulfur, of course, hydrogen over here. But most of the other elements don't really come into play very much in organic chemistry. There's a lot of oh, some of the metals here, sodium, magnesium, we'll use things like that. Some of the catalysts we'll use, uh, nickel, copper, whatever. But most of the chemistry we'll talk about is going to be carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, oxygen. So that's a simple periodic table to memorize. All right, let's return to what we were saying about electron configuration. As you recall, um, we have two types, two levels of electrons um, that are in carbon. The inner guys here, I said we would call the core. They are there, they must be there, but they don't participate in reactions. Valence electrons are on the outside. Those are the guys that form bonds. Nucleus, of course, teeny tiny spot in the middle. For carbon, like I said, we have two energy levels. The energy levels actually correspond to the period in the periodic table. As you go down in the periodic table, as we know it now, there are seven periods. The periods are the horizontal lines, and those are going to represent the number of electrons that can reside um, in the particular atom in that particular row. There's a uh, simple equation for this where n is the number here. <clears throat> in the first period, we can have 2n squared. If n is 1, that means 2 electrons in our first period. We can have 8 electrons in our second. 18, 32, 50, whatever. Most of the stuff that we deal with in organic chemistry, as we saw from the previous slide, is going to be our first three periods. <clears throat> now, when you're in a given period, we have electrons that we have to put somewhere. The electrons are put into what are called orbitals. Every orbital is simply a calculated region of space where the electron is likely to be found. The simplest orbital is an s orbital. It's spherical. Every orbital can hold two electrons and only two electrons. So we'll start off with the s orbital, carbon have an S orbital. Next we have the P orbitals. P orbitals, again they hold two electrons each. <clears throat> These are lobes 
two lobes oriented on the um, x, y, and z axes. Um, you would like to think that if we have two electrons, there's one here and one here. It doesn't work that way. Um, they're actually just somewhere in that region of space. Uh, it's interesting to note that they can be here, they can be here, but they're never ever in the middle. How do they get from one side to the other? Well, who knows. After the P's, we have the D's and the F's. Now the D's and the F's are just really cute orbitals. Again, these are regions of space, they can each hold two. Carbon is only going to have S and P orbitals. So that's really all we're dealing with. Um, the D and the F are just really cute. You know, my favorites are these guys with the donut around the middle. Two donuts here. But they just represent, again, regions of space that elements can place the electrons in. Yeah. So the number of theta bonds you have will determine if it's an SV2 to SV3? Uh, yeah, we're going to do hybridization in a, in a minute. Um, carbon does have S and P orbitals. And we'll see, in order to meet its valence, it's going to have to combine this by hybridization. All right. If we look at the first period here, according to our little um, equation, we can have two electrons, and this makes sense looking at the periodic table. We have one electron here, we have two electrons in helium. In our second period, we can have a total of eight electrons. We're going to put them one, two into the s orbital, get it filled. <clears throat> then we're going to come over here to the p orbitals and start putting them in. Carbon will have two electrons in p orbitals. Um, nitrogen would have three, four, five, six, whatever. Third period, <clears throat> we can actually have um, 18 electrons. Put the first two in an S, put the others over here, the next one's in a P. Um, the D guys here are missing. That's because the energy of the D orbitals, of uh, 3D orbitals, is actually greater than the energy of the 4S. So we don't put anything in there. By the time we get to the fourth period, we're starting to fill Ds. Um, same sort of thing. 4S fills. Now we do our Ds. Here's my favorite. And then we fill our Ps. This is the way the periodic table is organized. Now, as we fill an orbital, we're going to place two electrons in there, one at a time. The rule for that is that because electrons are, can be described, now they're not really, but they can be described as rotating electric charges. That as you rotate an electric charge, you can generate a magnetic field. This magnetic field around the electron can be oriented two ways, up and down. So we will use little arrows up and down to indicate the spin of the electrons in the orbital. As we put <coughs> electrons in, they must have opposite spin. Now this is a cute little movie. It always sounds much more official when she says it. Any spinning electric charge creates a magnetic field. Spinning electrons produce magnetic fields with an identifiable magnetic polar orientation, so-called north or south. The polar orientation of a given electron is determined by the direction of its spin. So, bottom line here, electrons have this property of spin. <clears throat> electrons in an orbital must have opposite spin. Uh, this is called Hund's rule. Hund was a guy. And basically what this means is that if we want to show electron configuration for something like hydrogen, hydrogen is in our first period up here. It will have one electron, and we would put it in like that. 
Helium is also in our first period. It can have two electrons. We would put the first one in with this spin orientation, and the second one must go in opposite. We abbreviate this 1s1 and 1s2. Whenever you use the abbreviation, make sure you remember that the electrons there are of opposite spin. Any questions? All right, think about carbon. <coughs> Let's go ahead and write an electron configuration for carbon. Yeah? Does it matter if your arrow's up or down? The first one? Doesn't matter. It's just something we made up. I always put the first one up because I'm optimistic. All right, carbon, atomic number is six. Remember, the atomic number represents the number of protons in the nucleus. So neutral carbon will have six electrons. Because we are in our second period here, that means our first period electrons are going to be full. So we're going to put two electrons into our 1s orbit, orbital. Once the 1s is filled, then we'll start on our uh, second level orbitals. First are going to come the s's, and then the p's. So we would show it like this. Our 1s is filled. One up, one down. We are in our second period. Our atomic number is 6, so we're over here where we're filling D's, that means the 2S is already filled. Now there are three D orbitals. The exclusion principle requires that as we fill this, we put in electrons one at a time with the same spin. Then we put in electrons of the opposite <coughs> spin to fill up the other orbital. So our two electrons are not both going to be here, they're going to be here and here. <coughs> this would be the electron configuration of carbon. This would be 1s2, 2s2, 2p2. Again, it's assumed when you write the abbreviation that you know <laughs> that these are all paired with opposite spin, and that these two guys are in separate p orbitals, and they have the same spin. Yeah? Wouldn't you sometimes apply when you have the two p's, you want to put the arrows in the first one? And so grab the charge. You've got to put them in one at a time. Same spin, different orbitals. Let's go ahead and do, well, I guess I'm not going to do fluorine. Uh, if we had done, um, let's say we were doing fluorine, okay? So with fluorine, we would have, over here, we would have a total of seven electrons. So we would fill up our uh, 2s, that's two of them. Then we have five electrons here to put in our p's. We would draw it one, two, three. Then we would pair them four and five. So you put them in one at a time, same spin. Then you pair with opposite spins. All right, again, this is general chemistry. Um, but we're just kind of trying to get up to the point here where we can talk more about the configuration of carbon and where the particular bondings come from in carbon compounds. Let's start with what are known as Lewis dot structures. Remember Lewis dot structures is a simple mechanical means to represent valence electrons. Now, Lewis developed this approach long before anybody had thought of orbitals, okay? 
but he had figured out, people had figured out, that with something like carbon, that there were going to be four valence electrons. Now, as we just said, we know that two of those are in the 2s, and two are in p orbitals. But still, 2 plus 2 is 4. So what Lewis said, if you want to explain bonding, what you do is you just start off with your chemical symbol, figure out how many valence electrons you have, and you place them around the atom, one at a time, until you fill up all four, then you start to pair them. So for carbon, we would have one, two, three, four unpaired electrons in the Lewis structure. Now as you recall, carbon lives here in group 4A. Nice thing about using the US version of the periodic table is that the group number 1A, 2A, 3A, 4A, 5A, 6A, 7A, 8A correspond to the number of valence electrons. So here we are at carbon, group 4, 4 valence electrons. Quickly, go ahead and do the same thing here for fluorine. Fluorine is also group 2. It's over here, I'm sorry, second period. It's in group 7 of our second period. So go ahead and draw the Lewis structure for fluorine. Well, if you want to describe this using orbitals, we would say that because this is in group 7, that we have two orbitals or two electrons in the 2s. And we have five electrons in the 2ps. But that's a total of seven. And remember, Lewis just counts electrons. So we start off with four electrons, one at a time, and then pair them up. Remember, whenever you write a Lewis structure, it's simply bookkeeping. It doesn't matter if my extra electron is whatever, wherever. But the convention is, if you have less than four, more or less, they go in singly. If you have more than that, you start to pair them. It's just bookkeeping, but it's useful bookkeeping. The thing that's useful about it is that it's easy to explain bonding. Covalent bonding is mostly what we're going to do in organic chemistry. Let's look at an example here. Chlorine. Chlorine is in our third period, right here. It's in our seventh group. So it will have seven valence electrons. We show this as seven little dots around our chlorine. Now, chlorine exists in nature as CO2, diatonic. So there's a covalent bond between these two chlorines. We show this by simply bringing in our second chlorine. We take the two unshared electrons, combine them, to make our bonding orbital. And you'll note we have eight electrons around this chlorine, eight electrons around this chlorine. You count the bonding pair twice. And that's why they are truly shared. Um, organic chemists get tired of drawing little dots. Um, as you draw structures, we'll replace these Lewis dot conventions with what's called the Kekulé structure, where we use a horizontal line a bond to indicate the bonding pair of electrons. Any questions? How do you spell that? How do you spell that? Kekulé. K-E. Wow. 
now. <laughs> I believe the E has a little funny symbol over it. K E K U L E. Will we calculate <clears throat> when we talk about <clears throat> benzene? Um, Kekulé was an early organic chemist, <clears throat> the one that um, came up with the correct structure for benzene. Now, he got it right for the wrong reasons, but nonetheless, he was the first to get it right. We'll actually see benzene and Kekulé structures today. For right now, let's just practice drawing a couple Lewis structures. Ammonia is an H3. Here's a little periodic table. Very quickly, just jot down the Lewis structure for the molecule ammonia. In organic chemistry, we will deal with a functional group called an amine. It will have the same basic properties as ammonia, undergo a lot of the same reactions, etc. Step one, we want to look at our molecule, identify our elements, figure out how many valence electrons we have. We're going to put nitrogen in the middle, and we're going to put electrons around it. Each nitrogen, group five here, will have five electrons. Each hydrogen, we'll have one. Now just like we did with our fluorine, CO2, all we have to do to make bonds here is to take and snuggle these guys up. Remember, two electrons per covalent bond. We now have eight valence electrons around our nitrogen. Every hydrogen as two. Remember from the octet movie, <clears throat> magic number is eight. We're trying to get eight valence electrons around our central atom. Hydrogen is the exception. First period, it can only have two. But these are all trying to be over here, just like the noble gases. If we drew this as a calculate structure, we would replace the bonding electrons with our dashes. Whenever you see that, remember what this says to you in your head, two electrons in a covalent bond. Yeah? Isn't that trigonal planar? Um, yeah, tricky? we'll do um, the, uh, well, no, it's not trigonal planar. Uh, it depends on whether you're talking about the um, electron configuration or the um, atomic configuration, but we'll see that in just a second. Go ahead, use the same technique, and let's do nitrogen. Nitrogen exists in nature as N2. Nitrogen is a group 5 element. Remember, we want to try to get 8 valence electrons around each nitrogen. Well, as I look at this, <clears throat> I could take these two right here and make a bond. That would work. That would give us one, two, three, four, five, six electrons on each nitrogen, and that's not good enough. So what I'll do is I'm going to take a couple of these guys, move them here in between. Now, I can make two covalent bonds, two, four, six, seven electrons on each nitrogen, getting better. <coughs> but if I go and move the last two, now I can move these in, and I can make three covalent bonds. This is a triple bond. Each nitrogen has a full set of eight valence electrons, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, on both of them. 
And we would show this as something like this. Three bonds between our nitrogens. That's why nitrogen is so stable. Um, every covalent bond has associated amount of energy with it. Here we have three covalent bonds. Really, really tough to break the nitrogen-nitrogen bond. Likewise, forming the nitrogen-nitrogen bond from something it doesn't have multiple bonds to nitrogens evolves a great deal of energy. Most simple explosives involve the formation of the nitrogen triple bond and releasing a great deal of energy as that happens. Let's use the same approach. Very quickly do carbon monoxide. Carbon is group four, oxygen is group six. So we have four valence electrons on our carbon, six valence electrons on our oxygen. Now once again, <clears throat> I can draw a bond here for our oxygen, that would give us one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Carbon, we would have two, four, five. It's not quite there yet, are we? <clears throat> Remember, Lewis structures are truly bookkeeping tools. So the fact that we have paired electrons really doesn't mean much. It's just bookkeeping. So what I'm going to do first is to take like this pair of electrons and just put them here. One, two. Now I'm making two covalent bonds between these guys, aren't I? Like we did with nitrogen. I can grab these two things up here and move them in. Triple bond. The one thing that looks really stupid, though, is that we have two unpaired electrons here on the carbon. That's not a good thing. We don't like unpaired electrons. So let's take and move these up. And now we have carbon monoxide with our triple bond. Carbon has eight electrons. <coughs> Oxygen has eight electrons. Any questions? All right, let's take the concept of Lewis structures and move it into the term valence. <coughs> when we speak of valence, <coughs> we're talking about the number of bonds that are typically formed, covalent bonds that are typically formed to an atom. Oxygen. Most compounds we will deal with. Oxygen will have a valence of two. Two covalent bonds. In its Lewis structure, it will have two unshared pairs of electrons. Nitrogen. We will have three bonds. We saw that. We just did ammonia. It will also have one unshared pair of electrons. The chemistry of nitrogen compounds, again, these are called amines, is going to be based on the fact that they have this pair of electrons and they can act as a base or what we'll call a nucleophile. Something like boron. We use boron compounds uh, in organic. <coughs> uh, valence of three, but because boron is here in group three, it does not have the extra electrons that we have here on nitrogen. And if you think about it, this poor boron only has two, four, six electrons around it. That makes it a very good electron acceptor. We'll call that a Lewis acid. The chemistry of boron compounds that we will see in organic chemistry 
is going to be faith based on the fact that this boron dearly wants another pair of white drops. And finally, carbon, our favorite, has a valence of four. Neutral carbon will always have four covalent bonds. I take that back. There is one clear example where that is not the case. But it will almost always have four simple covalent bonds if it's neutral. All right, let's address the question then. If carbon has a valence of four, forms four covalent bonds, how in the world do we do this based on the fact that we have paired electrons here and only two single electrons here? We have to form four bonds. OK. How about if we just say, I'm going to take my two electrons here, and I'm just going to put one of them up here in the P. Because they've got to make four bonds. <coughs> so that's the only place to put an electron, is to move it from the S up to a P. <coughs> All right. This S electron here, <clears throat> this is spherical symmetry, isn't it? And these guys are lobes oriented x, y, and z. So our 2s orbital looks like this, and our 3p orbitals look like this. Now we have to make four bonds. The question we want to ask is, what is the geometry of this compound going to look like? And for a very long time in organic chemistry, this was a real problem. <clears throat> it only makes sense that because we have S and P orbitals, that we would get, oh, some kind of unique uh, geometry. Ones that were suggested, combining our S and our P's, um, to make different geometries would look like this. Square planar, trigonal pyramidal, or tetrahedral. Now tetrahedral is a geometry that is not taught in kindergarten. Should um, In a tetrahedron, all of the bond angles here, so between these two hydrogens, would be 109.5. The atom in the middle is suspended equal distance between all four of these guys around it. Now today we would just take a compound, we would do an x-ray structure, and we would figure out what it looked like by analyzing the x-ray structure, right? That's how you do it these days. But way, way back in the old days, they figured out that carbon must be tetrahedral by a very simple logical exercise. Turns out that there is only one dichloromethane. Only one. If we had square planar carbon, we could imagine one where our two chlorines were on opposite sides, and one where our two chlorines were next to each other. So we would have two isomers. If we had trigonal pyramidal, we could have one up here in our axial position, one equatorial. Or we could have two equatorial. Again, two isomers. But with tetrahedral, regardless where you put your two chlorines, they're always going to be adjacent <coughs> and 109 degrees apart. So these guys, these guys over here, same bond angle. These guys here, same bond angle. Carbon is tetrahedral. <coughs> okay, now why? <coughs> well, I hope when you did general chemistry, you covered the valence shell electron pair repulsion theory. 
It's a very, very simple way to describe the concept of hybridization and to describe molecular geometry. This is methane. One carbon in the middle, more hydrogens around it. <clears throat> the Vesper theory basically looks at how many things are attached to your central atom. And it says, whether those are electron pairs or covalent bonds, it doesn't matter. <clears throat> but they want to be as far apart from each other as they can be. As far apart as you can. So, if we have two things attached, say two covalent bonds, the simplest way to draw this so that they're the furthest apart they can be is to make them like this, 180 degree angle between them. Now this is actually a movie. I'm going to try to run it in stop motion. So two things, we have 180 degrees. Now if we bring the third thing in, the third thing, remember it can be a covalent bond or a pair of electrons, doesn't matter. As it comes in, these guys want to separate in such a way that all three of them are as far apart as possible. <clears throat> we can do that by putting all of these in a plane. 120 degree bond angles. We will see that <clears throat> um, a lot of carbon compounds are going to have this 120 degree bond angle when you have three things attached. Finally, <clears throat> if we bring a fourth one in, that's when we get our tetrahedron. <clears throat> Again, this, 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 this in the back. All the angles are 109 degrees. <clears throat> and if these were um, atoms, like they are in methane, they would all be equal distant from your central atom. The so valence shell electron pair repulsion simply says we're going to get a geometry based on the number of things around your central atom. Any questions? Now, you know, this is a very nice um, explanation. Um, there's also a much more complicated way to look at it. And that is to actually do a mathematical hybridization of the orbitals. Now, you can argue, well, gee, which one came first? The fact is that carbon is tetrahedral. We have orbitals of different geometry. You would expect that not to give us tetrahedral, would we? So what we have to do is go through and solve again and try to come up with a combination of these orbitals that generates a region of space where we have tetrahedral geometry. As we do that, we're going to take our 1s and our 3p orbitals. We're going to combine them and make what's called an sp3 orbital. We're going to put four of these all together and make a geometry that looks like this. Carbon, when it has four things attached, no multiple bonds, will be sp3. That's our carbon. Does that always apply? That always applies if you have four things attached, no double bonds, it won't be an sp3 carbon. And all those bonds are considered alpha bonds? They're all sigma bonds. Sigma bonds. Sigma bonds. Sigma bonds. Good point. Sigma bonds, that's the word we use to describe a real um, bond. Sigma comes from so S orbital. So it has um, S orbital um, character. So it's going to be an SP3 always if carbon has just four, four things attached? And it's if it has four things and no double bonds, it will always be SP3. 
Now, we can also calculate what's known as a molecular orbital. So once we've done the hybridization, we can say, all right, if we look at methane, where are the electrons around it? We have four orbitals. We will see that we can come up with four molecular orbitals. This is an example of the highest occupied molecular orbital, HOMO. Um, and basically, it's just a shell that seems to surround the entire <coughs> uh, methane molecule. If we look at all four of our um, occupied orbitals, the geometry looks something like this. Here's where we were. There's another one that looks like this, like this, <coughs> and like this. So according to calculation, these are where the electrons are. These are increasing energy. <coughs> this is our lowest. There's our highest. <coughs> we also have four unoccupied orbitals. So this is where the electrons aren't. And they look like this. Kind of like the opposite of these guys. Again, increasing energy. The reason that, <coughs> or one of the nice things, about thinking about molecular orbitals. First of all, it describes where the electrons are around a given molecule. Okay, that's important to know. But also, there's a branch of chemistry called frontier molecular orbital theory. Now, McMurray's not going to do much in terms of frontier orbitals. <clears throat> I don't do much either. He doesn't like it. I don't like it. But it works something like this. The logic is that if you look at the occupied molecular orbitals, that's where the electrons are, then if you're going to do a reaction, these electrons are going to flow from one molecule to another, from an occupied orbital to an unoccupied orbital. And that's how you make the bond. This is cyanide. This is the highest occupied molecular orbital. Most of the electrons are here. Right here where we have the carbon with the negative charge. Now it's known that carbon can react with what we will call bromomethane. <clears throat> this is a methane with a bromine attached instead of a hydrogen. When these two react, what happens is the electrons will attack from the carbon, it will attack here, and the bromine will leave. In organic, we will actually use arrows like this to describe the flow of electrons. We have a special word for that, we call these curvy arrows. All right, so this is a real reaction. In terms of frontier orbital molecular or whatever, molecular orbital theory, bromomethane looks like this. This is its lowest unoccupied. So this is the biggest hole in the molecule. This over here from carbon is where the electrons are. This is the biggest place they can go. And the reaction simply involves these electrons moving into this empty space and the bromine leaving. So it's a nice way to look at um, these things, especially as we get into next semester. When we talk about cycloaddition reactions, we'll return to molecular orbitals because it makes it easier to understand the stereochemistry of cycloadditions. All right, let's go back to our friend Lewis, and let's draw a Lewis structure for a two-carbon compound that we will call ethane.
question. Yeah. I didn't see the, the frontier and the orbital theory slides mm -hmm. in your slideshow. Was that something extra? No, it's not in there. Okay. It's a slide I added. And that's one thing about my slides. <clears throat> um, they, uh, they are very dynamic. The night before, I will tend to add slides, delete slides, whatever. Uh, so the guides that you get, the stuff that I print, are a good starting point, but they're always going to change. All right, carbon, group four, four valence electrons, hydrogen, group one, one valence electron. This is one carbon with four hydrogens. Here's our second carbon. In order to make this compound, we simply need to take these two electrons make a covalent bond, another bond here, 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 here. <clears throat> Convert our little electron dots into dashes. This is ethane. Now each of these is a tetrahedral carbon, isn't it? And so this is what it would actually look like. Each of these carbons is tetrahedral. All of these bond angles are 109.5 degrees. That was fun. Let's do it for ethene. Two carbons, four hydrogens. Well, just like before, <clears throat> group four, group one, that's one carbon, and our second carbon. Easily we can make single bonds up to our hydrogens, right? Easily we can make a single bond between these two carbons, and we have two electrons left over. Just like we did with nitrogen in two, we're going to take those and we're going to move these electrons in. So we're going to make a carbon carbon double bond. If we draw this using the Kekulé line bond formulation, it would look like that. This is what ethene looks like. Think about valence shell electron pair repulsion. We have three things attached here, don't we? <clears throat> One, two, three. Therefore, we have trigonal geometry. These bond angles are 120 degrees. Now let's think a minute about this double bond. Where does this double bond come from? We have 1s and we have 3p orbitals to work with. We're going to make three covalent bonds, however, and that requires only three orbitals. When we combine these three, we wind up with Trigonal geometry, this is a planar molecule, all of our angles are 120 degrees. However, we still have the one p orbital left over. Because we use 1s and 2p's, we call this sp squared, as opposed to sp cubed. Well, remember, we still have two p orbitals left over. Each carbon has one. So what I'm going to do is show these on this structure. Now, 
when you have orbitals or regions of space where electrons can reside, and they are aligned with each other, like these are, they overlap. Energetically, this electron is shared now between both of these atoms. The molecular orbital for this would look like this, kind of like a hot dog. We have one pi orbital here. We call it a pi because it comes from pu orbitals. If we cut it open inside the hot dog, you can see here's our sigma network, our three sigma bonds. And we have our pi orbitals above and below looking like this. Now, an interesting, okay, <clears throat> when, we, when we say we have a carbon-carbon double bond, what we say is, if one of these is our sigma bond, the other one is our pi bond corresponding to the electrons above and below the plane. As a shortcut, we just use two bonds, but we remember, one is a sigma, and one is this cloud of electrons above and below the plane. This is what it looks like in what's called an electrostatic potential map. Electrostatic potential map, <clears throat> always often referred to as electron density. It's not really, but it's close enough. If you look at the electrostatic potential map here, <clears throat> this is colored. The, the redder it is, the more electrons are there. Here, where we have our pi bond above and below our plane, we have our giant red spot. We'll see that the reactions of carbon-carbon double bonds are going to occur here, where the electrons are. That's why it's important to know where this comes from. One other important thing about this, as I said, in order for these guys to overlap, <clears throat> they have to be parallel to each other. That means if I take and I rotate this 90 degrees, so I have this, they will no longer overlap. They don't overlap you lose one of these bonds, don't you? Energetically, that's a bad thing. So rotation around an sp squared bond does not occur. Now we'll see that this has an interesting effect. If we have two compounds, both of these have four carbons, and they have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight hydrogens. But on this one, our two one carbon units are on opposite sides of our double bond. Here they're on the same side. These are different chemical compounds. They're called isomers, stereoisomers. <clears throat> they do not typically interconvert, although you can interconvert them. Interesting point from biochemistry. As we look at this, we're all using vision, aren't we? The actual organic chemistry involved in vision. Retin-al is long-chain aldehyde. In the middle, it has a cis double bond. When a photon hits that double bond, it excites the electrons. We get rotation to the trans isomer. That conformational change is detected by your cell, sends a message to your brain, I just saw a photon. And that's how we see it. Isn't that neat? Yeah. So it, uh, the double, it rotates around the double bond? Right. Is Once we, what we do is we move the electrons from our pi system to an excited state. When we do that, there's no barrier now. And so it goes to the more stable trans isomer. 
All right, there's one more bit of bonding we need to do, call it SP. We're going to take one S and one P. We're going to combine these and we're going to make a sigma network that looks like this. We have two things, two orbitals, two bonds, according to valence shell and contrary repulsion. This is going to be linear. Now, just like we did with our double bond, we remember that we must have p orbitals on each of these carbons. <clears throat> Place them on here. They're lined up. We're going to get overlap here, 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 and here. And we will make two sets of pi bonds. Our carbon, carbon thing is here in the middle. We will say each of these represents one pi bond. So we're starting here with our sigma bond, and we add our two pi bonds, and we get a carbon-carbon triple bond. This is electrostatic potential map for the triple bond. Once again, the big belt in the middle here, this is where the electrons are. When a triple bond undergoes reaction, it will occur where the electrons are. All right, so just recapping. We have three types of hybridization we want to look at. SP3, single bonds, four of them, 109 degree bond angle. SP squared, we have a double bond. <clears throat> Sigma network is trigonal, so we have 120 degree angles. And finally, a triple bond, <clears throat> um, linear, lots of high electrons in the middle. We will see that these correspond to what are called, oops, functional groups. This is an alkane. This one's supposed to show up yet, I'm sorry. An alkane, where we have only um, single bonds. This is an alkene. Look at it quickly. It contains an sp squared center and an alkyne, where we have a triple bond, and it looks like that. Now, why this annoying sheet keeps coming up is I'm supposed to tell you or give you this. We're going to take a very quick break, and then we're going to come back and work these problems. All right, let's go ahead and <clears throat> start looking at these very, very simple problem set. Um, this comes from Organic Chemistry Online. Um, <clears throat> Organic Chemistry Online is a product that I wrote about 25 years ago. It was the very first and for a very long time the only online organic tutorial. Um, it still lives. It was adopted by John McMurray's textbooks. Um, it still lives. I will give you the link to it later. Um, and it's a very nice place to review. Um, it <clears throat> has some issues with browsers these days, especially with Java. Because it uses a lot of Java, it will drive you nuts. Your computer will ask you over and over again, do you really want to run this program? Yes. But it will continue to ask you. Sometimes it won't even let you even if you say yes, but, but it should be okay. Our first question here, indicate the carbon that displays SP3 hybridization. Remember, when we're talking about SP3, we're talking about only single bonds. <coughs> the only carbon in this molecule that has only single bonds is this guy right here. This has four single bonds, this would be tetrahedral, 
this would be sp3 hybridization. <coughs> The carbon-carbon carbon bond angle in this highlighted chain would have what value? As we look down our carbon chain, we have a single bond and a double bond, don't we? So this is the central carbon. This is an sp squared carbon, isn't it? Because it's an sp squared carbon, this bond angle here is 120 degrees. Look for your chain. One, two, three. Central carbon here has a double bond, therefore, it's sp squared. Bond angles in an sp squared carbon are all 120 degrees. Indicate the oxygen that will be sp squared. Now an oxygen, <clears throat> we remember, has a valence of two. Right? Both of these oxygens have two bonds. This is a double bond. These are single bonds. Whenever you see a double bond, you think sp squared. This oxygen out here with the double bond is sp squared. Another bond angle. <clears throat> we're looking for the CCO. So what we're looking at is this CCO. Our central atom is going to be this carbon. That carbon is sp squared. Because it's sp squared, this bond angle here is 120 degrees. <clears throat> Find your central atom, double bond, sp squared, 120 degrees. How many sp squared atoms do we have? Four. Well, this is going to be sp squared, isn't it? So is this. 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 And so is that. Seven sp squared carbons. One sp squared oxygen. How many sp atoms do we have here? Remember an sp gave us a triple bond, didn't it? Here we have a triple bond between two carbons. So both of these are going to be sp squared. Triple bond nitrogen. Same rule applies. Whenever you see a triple bond, you're thinking, SP hybridization. <clears throat> How many SP3 atoms are in this model? How many sp3 atoms? 
Remember, an sp3 carbon will have four bonds attached. So. This nitrogen only has three things attached, doesn't it? But remember, we said nitrogen always has the lone pair of electrons. Therefore, this also has four things attached, three bonds and a pair of electrons. <coughs> Therefore, as we go around here, we have six carbons in a ring, seven, eight hybridized atoms. Remember, it depends on how many total things are attached. Okay. And the fourth thing here is this so pair of electrons. Behind. And speaking of pairs of electrons, how many unshared pairs of electrons do we have in this guy? Well, oxygen, we said, has a valence of two, right? And it has two unshared pairs of electrons. Nitrogen, as we've just been saying, has one unshared pair of electrons. Therefore, two on this oxygen, two on this oxygen, and one on the nitrogen. Two bonds, two pairs, unshared. Any questions? Now again, make sure you please put your name on this sheet and carefully and clearly at your email address if you like, so I can make sure you're in the class properly and I can get to you. This is the organic interactive. This is an old version. Um, this should, well, this lives at chemistryonline.com. That's my website. <coughs> um, that's where I have the material for general, <coughs> for um, introductory chemistry. This is an old partition for organic. The link that you want is this guy up here, organic interactive. That will take you. You can also do organic chemistry old. This is a 1995 version. Believe it or not. There was an internet in 1995. <clears throat> organic interactive will take you to the Brooks Cole or Sengaj uh, website. <clears throat> if you're interested in this link to organic interactive. So you choose a chapter of some sort, click on this link, and you will get problems. The set that we just worked was this one. The one we will work later today <coughs> is this one. For every chapter, there are oh, five or six problem sets like that. Do you purchase this or subscribe to this? Nope, nope, it's hard. Oh, wow. What was, what, was the what was the URL again? Um, it would have a link on Blackboard. You do. There's a link to it on Blackboard. Nope. I didn't put the URL up there. So. But go to Blackboard and follow the link. Okay. What was the section again? And don't tell anybody about it. <laughs> because this is not a, a public site. All right, carbon compounds. As we've seen, we can connect carbons into chains. The really neat thing about organic chemistry is you can arrange these chains in just remarkable ways. Here we have six sp cubed carbons in a ring. You'll note the geometry of this ring. It's based on ups and downs, isn't it? That allows each of these carbons to have virtually perfect 
tetrahedral geometry. Here we have a chain of carbons with a one carbon chain dangling off. Here's another cyclic thing. This is another ring going up, another ring going down. This is what's called a polycyclic compound. You can have billions of ways to put these things together. That's what makes organic chemistry so amazing. We can also stick in what we call hetero atoms, where hetero means something else. We've seen nitrogen in our compounds. Here's the nitrogen. Red is oxygen. <clears throat> this is an OH, another one. This is an alcohol. This is the structure of morphine. Glucose, um, fruit sugar, if you will. A ring with five carbons and one oxygen. OH groups around. There's a CH2OH in the back. Now, as we go to represent these compounds, we're going to need ways to draw them quickly and easily. We've been using ball and stick models. <clears throat> ball and stick model is very nice. It gives you great connectivity. You can see your geometry nicely. If you leave the little balls off, you get what are called driving models after driving. Um, it's a very simple way to assemble a model of an organic compound. The best way, of course, is to use a space filling model because that shows just exactly what this stuff looks like. Um, <clears throat> these are all on the same scale. So <clears throat> when we draw a ball and stick or a driving model, this is really the molecular size that we're talking about. Now, as we go to represent this molecule, for example, four carbons, ten hydrogens, we could do it using the molecular formula, C4H10. The problem is that tells us nothing about what this compound really looks like. We could use what's called a condensed structure. In a condensed structure, we have all of the carbons shown, all of the hydrogens shown in a condensed format. So this is a CH3 attached to a CH2, attached to a CH2, and finally another CH3. We could draw a classic Kekulé structure where we take each of these carbons, we put on all the hydrogens, this is a real bother to do, isn't it? Because it's a real bother, organic chemists have devised something called a line structure. In a line structure, all you do is show your carbon-carbon backbone and any heteroatoms. We have four carbons in a row, Carbon one, two, three, four. <clears throat> whenever you see a line structure, and that's what we're going to see most, whenever you see a line structure, you know, you are supposed to know, a truncated line like this, something that just goes up and stops, is a CH3. Anytime you have a vertex, that's a CH2. Now, let's take our Kekulé structure. This is what a classic line structure would look like. Four carbons, one, two, three, four. The reason it zigzags up and down is that each of these are tetrahedral. And this intends to show the stereochemistry, the spatial chemistry of all four carbons. Now, sometimes you'll see a line structure written like this. Just to help you out, sometimes people will put CH3s on the end instead of just leaving them as truncated things. 
so that you know. However, some people would look at this and say this looks stupid because this looks like this carbon is bonded to the hydrogen. Of course it's not. And so they'll write it this way with your CH3 written backwards. At some point in your life you will see line structures drawn in all of these formats. Make sure you can look at them, figure out what is what. What is really meant? We'll also show structures in different formats. This is a classic line structure modified to show the methyl groups. If I take this, this compound here, this structure, and I rotate it a bit so that one of these carbons is coming towards me, and the other one's going back. I get what's lovingly called a sawhorse projection. In a sawhorse, we're going to show all the things attached, except not the carbon. So our four carbon chain is one, two, three, four. The nice thing about a sawhorse is that it's useful for looking at the geometry of our front and our back carbon. Another way to show a sawhorse is called a Newman projection. In a Newman, we rotate this thing all the way so that this guy is now totally in front. That's him. We can't see this bond because we're looking straight down it. The carbon in the back we show as a big ball so we know there. And these are the things that are attached to it. <clears throat> Structural, line drawing, sawhorse, and Newman. Depending upon what you're trying to show, being able to look at them and convert one to the other is important. Here's just a quick little movie I made. This is the driving model. <clears throat> Four carbon unit again. We're going to take and rotate it first to a sawhorse and then to a Newman. Not a real elegant movie. <coughs> sawhorse, Newman. Driving model, sawhorse, and Newman. All right, take a minute now. Let's take these representations and convert them into classic line drawings. This is not the problem set on the back yet. our CH3 group in parentheses. That means it's attached to this guy. We in fact have two of them attached to this guy. Step one, you want to look and see how many carbons you have in your chain. One, two, three, four, five. So you're going to make a zigzag with five thingies on it. On your second carbon here, this guy, we're going to put two one-carbon chains. And it should look like that. One, two, three, four, five. Carbon number two, two, CH3. Can we put two CH3? Yeah, you could. <coughs> you could. Um, it's tough to show real geometry, but as long as you have four things attached, that works. Our next one here. This is a ring, isn't it? We have one, two, three, four, five, six carbons in a ring. 
Note the geometry of your carbon skeleton here, the ups and downs. You draw this like that. Every vertex is a CH2. When we do cycloalkanes, that's chapter three, we will call this guy the chair conformation. If you think about it, and you have an imagination, you can imagine this as a lounging chair of some sort. The chair conformation. All right, here's a Newman we have to untangle. What we have to do is look for our longest chain. We have one, two, three, then the back carbon is four, five, six. So a six carbon zigzag. On carbon number one, two, three, we have a CH3. On our back carbon, which is carbon four, we have another CH3. So it should look like that. One, two, three, four, five, six. Carbon number three, methyl. Carbon number three, a methyl. Methyl is called a CH3. <clears throat> Let's see how we did this. This was the answer. If you take this and draw it as a sawhorse, so the opposite of what we've done before, this will be our front carbon. Have a two carbon chain attached. These guys, <clears throat> this is our back carbon here. Two carbon chain attached. And we have CH3s on carbon 3 and 4. I have a question. Um, do we have to know all the different ways to draw them? Of course. That's a silly question. Of course. And you must draw them beautifully. Yeah. So I'm still confused of how you're counting. You're counting up all the carbons that are in each structure, mm -hmm. and then each point on the line. Right. We're looking carbon. for the longest chain first. Our longest chain is 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So we have a 6 carbon back. I only see some four carbons there. Well, so. yeah, 1, 2, in 3, red. 4, yeah, yeah. 5, 6. Yeah. Right on the sawhorse, we don't show C's with these carbons. Oh, All right, so turn your sheet over and let's practice this. All right, for our first one here, we have four carbons and a bromine. 
All you're going to do here is instead of showing hydrogen, we're going to show bromine attached. So we'll do the same thing. We'll look for our longest chain of carbons. That's going to be one, two, three. Now on carbon number two, we're going to have a bromine attached and a CH3. That would work. Okay, so I have So all those have to be, they all have to connect to the center. Yep, everything has to be connected together. Exactly how you draw it is a little bit up to you. So every time there's not a hydrogen attached to the carbon, you show the element that is attached to it. Is that correct? But you don't show the hydrogen. Right. Just you only show other element. things. Mm -hmm. yes. This guy, we have one, two, three, four, five carbons in a row. So that's a five carbon zigzag, isn't it? On carbon number two, we have a CH3 dangling down. And we can draw it this way. Five carbons in a row. Carbon number two, we have a CH3. Is there a reason why it's facing up? Nope. I can have it down. can be sticking down. It can be... Well, this is straight up and down, it can be turned sideways, whatever. But it has to be on the second carbon. Right, it has to be on the second carbon. And your longest chain here has to have five carbons. Next guy here, our longest chain is going to be one, two, three, four carbons. On carbon number two, starting from this end, we're going to have two CH3 groups. What's it called again when you have the three that are like that? Three bonds? Well, this is a uh, quaternary it's not carbon. A carbonyl. That means it has no carbonyl and carbon oxygen double bonds. Yeah. <clears throat> this is a quaternary carbon means it has four things attached, four carbons attached. And finally, our last one. This is a sawhorse projection. Our longest chain would be one, two, three, four, five carbons. On carbon number one, two, three, we have a CH3. Where'd you? Where'd you? One, two, three, four, five. Carbon number three, we have a CH3. Draw a double bond. Our longest chain here is one, two, three, four, five carbons. So we do a five carbon zigzag. We have to put in double bonds on our first carbon and our third. <coughs> on our second carbon, we need a bromine. On our third carbon, we need a CH3. Whoops. All right. I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> Let's pretend <laughs> that we have a double bond here and a double bond here. I apologize for that. That's okay. I'm not challenging you. I understand. <laughs> Obviously, I do all of my slides myself. And I put in errors like this on purpose just to make sure you're paying attention. <laughs> This next guy, <clears throat> we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven carbons in a row. Even though we've drawn this thing with this thing pointing down, it's still just part of our longest chain. So we just need that. Seven carbon zigzag. One. 
two, three, four, five, six, seven. This is a funny looking ring, isn't it? But they're all CH2s, aren't they? We can simply draw it as a perfect hexagon. And this is where our work counts. Make sure it's perfect. As we've seen, we can also draw a six membered ring in a chair conformation, where we show the up and down geometry, or we can draw it flat like this. There's going to be a mistake on this one, too, so I apologize. <clears throat> As I was doing these, I neglected to go back and put in the double bonds. But here we have a ring. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That's eight carbons in our ring, right? So that's a stop sign. So you draw a perfect stop sign, and you put in alternating double bonds. Again, I left off my double bonds. I apologize. Should be one here, 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 and here. What about for spelling these? Oh, yeah. I'm sorry? What if we like spell them wrong? But like we have like the same kind of like you can say it out, but like <laughs> it's not spelled like totally correctly. Well, if you uh, will see that there are problems, well, we do nomenclature, okay? When we do nomenclature, you'll see that spelling must be exact. Exact. If not, yeah. exact. And you can't do so much as to put a comma or a space out of place. But that's nomenclature. We'll do that in chapter three. Maybe chapter two. I don't know. Hang on till tomorrow. All right. Well, this is it for today. This is chapter one. We will pick up with chapter two tomorrow. Please, hello, please return your book sheets to me. Make sure your name is on it. That way I can check to make sure that everybody is in fact on the I'm not gonna wait. Yeah. 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 Yeah.